Hello, I'm David Kosh from Sunrise. Tonight we catch up with the subject of a very special Australian story program which first went to air four years ago. Gemma Sissia, an Aussie girl from country New South Wales, set up a school for the poorest kids in Tanzania. It was such a remarkable tale that I was inspired to go to Africa myself to check it out and was absolutely blown away. Four years later, the School of St Jude is facing its biggest challenge yet, a challenge which has taken Gemma out of the schoolyard and on a mission across Australia. Did you find out how many tomorrow morning for breakfast? I'm calling them once we, once we pull up. Just so that we budget the DVDs and... But we have plenty of DVDs left, don't we? Unless yes, we but I think tonight we'll, there'll be a lot of people. Okay. We're six weeks in Australia and we don't have one day off in the entire itinerary and we're talking at least, you know, five times a day. I don't care, I'll sleep in the car, I'll... <laughs> not sleep at all. The wonderful director and founder of the School of St Jude in Tanzania. It's a killer itinerary, but it's essential. That's USB, okay. all right? USB, yeah, I've got to get you the uh, that little hand control thing, so. Okay. Each child has their own desk and chair, and we've been able to employ 127 local Tanzanian teachers. I have a huge responsibility and a lot of pressure on my shoulders, and I want to make sure that the school comes through the other end. It's really mind-boggling to even think that anybody, any human person, could do it. $10 will help buy 10 buckets of carrots. Uh, $100 will help buy a set of maths textbooks for one of our new classes. I had to trust when I gave Gemma to Africa or when I lost my daughter to Africa. We all still have to trust that God's the boss and this is just a hiccup in the growth and blossoming of St Jude's. So have you been sponsoring for years, haven't you? Yeah, have we? Yeah. yeah. Nice to meet you. I found people are extremely supportive of the school, but very cautious and hesitant with money. And so it's made it really hard because the reality is I've got 130 teachers back in Tanzania relying on me to come back with good news. When I first set foot in Africa years ago, I thought I could easily live here. I thought there was a lot of need for helping people here. How was school today? Want to sing a song? Yes. The school of St. Jude, I love you so much. We say thank you, Lord, for this beautiful school. I didn't find any cultural barriers and I didn't find that I had to have the newest jeans and the nicest boots on or anything like that and people took me as I was and they appreciated anything that I could do for them. I think I'm really lucky to be doing what I'm doing and to have the chance to do what I'm doing. But in reality I don't get much time to really think about all this good stuff because I've just got too much damn work to do. Now that I'm living here, I can't even imagine being anywhere else. I could never leave the children. I mean, I think I really have the best job anywhere anyone could ever have. You know, I get to make kids' dreams come true every day. It's fantastic work. How could I ever go back to a nine to five job? It's impossible. As I got to know her, I found that the most extraordinary thing about her was that there was no such thing as it can't be done. Your stuff. If anybody said, oh, no, it's a shame, you know, you won't be able to do that because, well, you know, officially and uh, bureaucratically, we don't have the ability to allow you to let this happen. <laughs> Gemma would sit there and look at them quite calmly and go, uh-huh. And then we go back to the office and she said, right, now, what we're going to try... <laughs> and there was never any doubt in her mind that it would happen somehow. I was brought up on a fine wool merino farm in northern New South Wales, about 80 k's north of Armidale. So I come from quite a big family. I have seven brothers and mum and dad. 
you want to put Nick up in your bike, Gemma? Yeah, OK, I'll call her. Nicky, come here and get up. <laughs> My parents have called me since I was quite young a bit of a challenge junkie. When I was at school, I loved uh, show jumping. Instead of hacking and sitting on my saddle nice, I always liked to jump the jumps. Yes, Gemma was very competitive. Everything she does, I guess she had to compete against the boys, the brothers all the time in her family. That's taught her to be competitive and fearless in lots of ways. She was always very definite in her views, even as a little girl. Uh, and the horses seemed to obey uh, what she was telling them. Uh, she's a very strong character, I'm afraid, and very determined. My family, my grandparents have all been quite religious. And uh, Mum and Dad have always instilled in us that there's a lot more to life than just playing and having fun. You know, I could go to a BNS on Saturday night, but I had to find a church somewhere on Sunday wherever I was to go to Mass. We have a prayer room in the home. It was originally our dining room, and it's now a little chapel or prayer room, as we call it. And it was always in the back of my mind that I'd like to become a nun. I was quite prepared to live in poverty and have chastity and everything like that. I was quite prepared because I hadn't really experienced any of that anyway. All of my family have always lived pretty simply, so the poverty thing, the thought of um, not having a husband, I suppose, I was going to happily do that if I felt right. What Mum and Dad have given to us, and I suppose Gemma's best way of giving that back and helping other people, that's probably why she was thinking of becoming a nun. When she was in Uganda, she was working at a, a convent with a local school over in one of the little villages. Oh, So around that time, I, I was tossing up what to do, you know, whether to stay in Uganda and become a nun or, you know, I also really liked, you know, the V8 Utes and the boys as well, so I wouldn't mind marrying a, a farmer and having five kids back in my hometown as well, so I was tossing a bit up. After a few months of working in Uganda, I went with an English girl to Kenya and then into Tanzania to go on safari to see the Serengeti Plains for our Easter holidays. So it turned out that the driver of the safari was a guy called Richard. In a few days on safari with him, I realised that Richard was quite a, a nice, strong, uh, wholesome lad who uh, is a great kisser on the side. Wow, the zebras. Ah, oh, picture, picture. It looks like coming from the drinking water. Oh, bitch, look. I suppose there's nothing like falling in love in the Serengeti. It's very romantic, all the animals around you, the lions at night, and it was a great place to fall in love with Richard. Look at the zebras, they are rich. I was really look at her and she's like, she's a beautiful girl and this is like automatic. I was, you know, I love someone, it's not because of something, it's coming automatically. But uh, I was scared to tell her anything because I was employing and, you know, my job is to show them animals, not to talk about love or whatever. <laughs> so the idea of becoming a nun simply faded away. It was very strange. After I met Richard, I stopped looking. I stopped searching. It was weird. After I met Richard, it was just meant to be. And um, I haven't looked back. I never even thought about any other man and I never thought about any other convent. And I just stopped looking. It was weird. <laughs> I must admit, when I said I wanted to marry Richard, I didn't have much support. I'm sure that my family thought I was going to carry water on my head and live in a mud hut and grass floor and have chickens running through all the bedrooms. When Gemma went over there, I had to trust in God. There were lots of worrying moments. When Mum wasn't very happy with me marrying Richard and moving to Africa, it really, really hurt me. I understand that being the only daughter, it's tough, but it still hurt me. Richard being black, may have been an issue. However, I think it would have been an issue had he been purple, green, Chinese, anything. I think that's, that's definitely a hard thing for Mum to deal with. I think 
another country, another, another culture, and I suppose the colour. I don't really think you can talk Gemma into or out of anything. We've never managed to do that. <laughs> And when she really did say she thought she was going to marry him, well, naturally, it was a shock. Because as a mother, I worry about um, your daughter's safety. Richard and I were married in 2001. Richard's grandfather was Maasai, you know, the spear holding the holes in the ears and everything, but uh, Richard's father was educated by the Lutheran missionaries and became a vet, and so his family are very westernised. I don't think Richard could hold a spear if he tried. I wanted to help two girls back in Uganda go to school. I started a $5 a month contribution scheme that my family and friends joined in on. I was approached by Richard's father. And he said, you know, Gemma, why are you helping all these kids in Uganda when we've got much poorer children over here in Tanzania? And he said, well, if I was to give you a small piece of land, would you be able to build a school for the poor here? And I went, Whoa, wow, I'd love to build the school. Think he'd be really easy? <laughs> she showed me a little photo and she said, Marie, that's where I'm going to build my school. And she said, I can see it. I can see it standing there. And I just looked at her face and I knew that she could see that school on that block of land. To me, it was just a photo of a block of land in Africa. I thought, well, you're young and you're dreaming. <laughs> People would say to me, oh, how much do you need to build a school, Jim? And me, from all my experience of building schools, said, oh, I don't know, maybe two or three hundred thousand dollars, I don't know. How much you got, Jim? Uh, Ten bucks. <laughs> We opened the school on January 29th, 2002, with a whole three children. The school is located in northern Tanzania, East Africa, outside of Arusha city, in a small village called Mashono. For a while there, the school was just being run by three Australian women who really had no idea what they were doing. Well, before that, I'd been working in film and television casting. Not a natural prerequisite for running a school in Tanzania, but um, it was just one of those things that every cell in my body, when I heard about this, just went, that's what you're going to do. So I just kind of knew. Sent her an email, said, my name's Kim Savile. Couple of hands, half a brain, can I help? She emailed me, email me back and went, yeah, sure, get over here. Uh, 2.1. Yeah, we are uh, 2.4. Probably 2.8, because bubble crack. When the school opened, I was much softer than I am now. I've become very hard because my job really is the troubleshooter. When people have problems, they come to me. No, no. School drivers to take them out tomorrow. 90% of my work would be pushing people. Yeah, so you getting me that new computer? The other one is not working. Uh huh, so I'm Billy Camille. Don't come late. Yes, I mean, she, she was a bully. I mean, she didn't sort of Please. charm people into doing things for her. She was a bully. And it worked. So, what's your lowest price? I need to know because I'm going to other shops. 11. 11? No. Santi, that's it. Mama Joe. Mm. Okay, I will do for you. What's this lady, Miss Gemma? She's a boss, she's somebody to be scared of. And I think it's hard for the local, the local men especially to deal with. And so it's just flat strap trying to keep it all together because it's wonderful having people sponsor our children. But then once we have 25 child sponsors, I have to have another classroom, another half a bus, a driver, a teacher, two more cooks, a cleaner, another lot of set, uh, textbooks, uh, desks, chairs, a bit more playground, uh, spoons and utensils for eating and maybe another pot for the cooks to use. And um, it takes a lot of work. Right, The entire funding of St Jude's comes from families, individuals, schools and service clubs. And appearing on Australian Story four years ago was a fabulous help to the school. Yes. At that point, we had 500 children, and thanks to a lot of people who watched the Australian story, we were able to put in at least 100 more children. Each week during our sponsorship selection season, we would get around 3,000 applicants. And maybe from those 3,000 applicants each week, maybe seven or eight might be successful. And we do that every week until we get our quota of 150 children. 
we're looking for children from really poor families who have a gift. So it's basically those who can pass our entrance tests, those who come legitimately from a government school, and those that are legitimately extremely poor. I would like to recognise the exceptional achievements of uh, six students. John Clement, who came first. Our original class are now in the first year of secondary school. They have great English and actually in the national exams last year, the entire class was placed in the top 10% of Tanzania. Every year when we get those national results and the kids surpass our, our wildest expectations and it just gives you that much energy to go, yeah, this is all worth it. Hi everyone, my name is Travis. I think anyone who comes out gets extremely caught up in the vision and the mission that the school has. And we realise it's not just a little school in Africa, it's not just teaching kids. It's giving them the chance to have leadership skills. Well done, Standard 7. They will go on to become leaders, movers and shakers in this society. Initially, Mum didn't want to come to Africa for various reasons. I think uh, she saw Africa as the place that took her daughter, and also Africa is quite scary to some people. I certainly did have my reservations. With seven brothers and only one girl, of course a mother, a caring, loving mother, would be anxious, and those anxious moments were many. But then a few of my brothers said that if she wanted to go to Africa, they would be prepared to go with her. This is the first morning at the school. We're just about to go for a bit of a tour. Gemma's about to show us. That's um, everybody sitting outside the admin office. It was great. In July 2007, Mum comes across with a few of my brothers and their families. I think the visit to Africa changed Mum. It's wonderful. So everybody, this is my family. Are you going to say hello? hello? And this is my mother. So this is my mum. And it was mind-boggling when I did go there and awe inspiring. So Nicholas is a number tattoo. Uh -huh. Welcome in the tunnel. The welcome in the beginning was overwhelming when I was presented with a goat from Richard's parents. That's Gemma's mother-in-law and father-in-law. Very big deal. We had a welcome party that night and actually ate the goat. Every week we have an assembly at the school every Friday, but the entire parent population came to this assembly. It was like 1,500 of them because they wanted to say thank you to her for basically giving me to them um, for basically allowing me to move to Africa and set up the school so that their kids could get an education. The children performed little acts and they had a lovely big card that said Mama Gemma and I was called Mama Gemma, uh, which was really cute. They put jewellery around my neck. They gave me chooks. They gave me packets of eggs, a live duck, and they gave me a beautiful big wooden giraffe, which is, was just beautiful. It was a day I'll never, ever forget because of the humbling of it, I guess. I was in tears and it was just overwhelming, just overwhelming. I, I just couldn't believe it had happened to anyone. I think watching Mum, I could see in her eyes and everyone's eyes that, you know, the past is finished and Mum could see why I was there. I think my relationship with Mum is better than it's ever been. She totally understands why I love Tanzania. She understands why I married Richard. She understands why I'm so devoted to the school. I fully understand how my daughter fell for the children of Africa and just wanted to help them in whatever way she could. And the way that was 
that gradually developed was the school. So that's, and that's continually growing. She has so many people that love her, they'll certainly be looking after her over there. I fully understand how Gemma lost her heart to her Africa. I would have liked to have been able to slow down a bit, but I feel like it's almost like this snowball coming down a mountain and it's getting faster and bigger and it's very difficult to, to slow down. But then we had a problem which was a lovely problem to have. We had too many kids and not enough land. The site goes, we're reading it like this, all right? We got together and thought, well, why don't we open a second school? On the ground floor, you've got two classrooms and a common room. And uh, after looking at over 200, we found a great little 30-acre farm about half an hour from the current campus. And over the last few years, we've been trying to raise money and push builders to build another primary school. It opened last year, 2008, and this year we have 650 students getting an education in our new primary school behind. This is the site of uh, Gemma's new boarding school. Ever since I started the school, the parents have been pushing and the students have been pushing for us to open boarding houses. And we started fundraising and ran a little boarding appeal where people could help buy beds. And the boarding houses, 12 boarding houses, which housed over four, 400 students, uh, opened at the beginning of 2008. And I think the biggest frustration for me is to keep the infrastructure in front of this rolling, increasing enrolment, 150 new kids every year. And uh, now at the school, they're around 1,200. This is the start of Gemma's secondary school. The children that we started the school with back in 2002 are now in secondary school and so over the last year or so we've built some classrooms for them so they can go into their first year of secondary school. <laughs> I look forward to 2014 because that will be the first year in almost 14 years where we won't have a builder on the site. Uh, every year we have to build at least six classrooms so our kids can go on to the next year level. I look forward to the time where we can just relax a little bit, consolidate and um, fundraise for all the tertiary funds so that the kids can go off to the university, but at least I don't have to build the university for a while. <laughs> it's almost hard to remember that when I first arrived here we had half a dozen kids, a couple of buildings, one bus, one computer, not a lot of electricity. It's extraordinary what has been done in this time. Through the inspiration of Gemma and all the people that I've worked with here and over 1,000, 1,500 kids, staff of 330. We had one teacher when I first arrived. I think the saying that uh, when the first world sneezes, the third world gets pneumonia is quite true. That happened with us. Towards the end of 2008, the global recession suddenly hit us quite hard. We started getting emails from long-term sponsors saying that their financial situation had changed and they were no longer able to sponsor their child, and uh, which was really sad because some of these sponsors have been helping the school since it started. So we actually have 185 students currently at the school who don't have sponsors. And because of that reason, at the beginning of 2009, I had to let go 47 workers, local workers from the school. 16 local teachers, uh, several cooks, cleaners, guards um, and gardeners. So it was heartbreaking. And so that's why, you know, I came to Australia for six weeks to try and raise money. Yep. Okay. No, that sounds good. Yep. Okay. I had to send an SOS out to every person who I know and ask them to get in contact with me uh, if they would be willing to help run an event for St Jude's. I'll talk to you later, Father. See you later. Bye. How are you? Um, nice to meet you. <laughs> you too? <laughs> um, yeah, well, we're about to start. In about and so from the end of April, I've been crisscrossing Australia. 
So I'm determined that by the time I get on the plane on the 16th of June, I'll have all my kids sponsored, all my teachers sponsored, so we can start selecting and employing the next lot for January. A few years ago, friends would do a, a beer night or a fundraising night in Balmain and raise $1,000. That was really exciting, but now $1,000 lasts for one minute at the school. We have sponsorship programs where you will be supporting a, a particular teacher or a particular student that you can come over and meet sometime. For the past year, we've been sponsoring a child at the school St Jude called Jaffet. Oh, wow. This year we found out that, you know, the school's fallen on hard times with the global financial crisis. No, that's okay. So we decided to have a fate to coincide with Gemma's that's good, that's good. arrival in Sydney. Okay, I'll just put this up. The worst case scenario with St Jude's is that for the first time it'll break my heart, but I won't be able to take 150 children into our program at the end of 2009. That means 150 children have to stay outside the gates instead of inside the gates. That means 150 children won't get the chance to be architects, doctors, because I will lose an entire year. I think the, the responsibility and pressure on my shoulders has doubled since the last Australian story in 2005. I would say on average five times a day, I'd like to give it away. <laughs> Uh, but I have a, a huge sense of responsibility to the staff and students and um, I understand that I'm the face of the school. I have 1,200 children relying on me to make sure that this school survives and I'm determined to do so. A few people ask me what's going to happen if I get hit by a truck or something and so over the last few years I've been trying to delegate the day-to-day -day running to leaders at the school but it takes a long time but uh, today in 2009 I'm proud to say that all of our academic leaders are Tenz Nen. People have asked me, why do you call the school the school St Jude? Well, St Jude is the saint of the hopeless cases. Well, a girl from Gaira trying to build a school in Africa, that's a serious hopeless case. <laughs> Even though we've been really strained this year because of the financial situation at the school, I'm sure that the school will come through for it because St Jude's up there and, um, you know, I don't think he would be able to live with himself if the school named after him would, would collapse. So I'm sure things will be fine. But if it doesn't, well, St Jude will want to watch out when I eventually get to heaven someday. 